What's going down, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Commander Ad Populum. Commander for the people, by the people, for the people. This is episode 39. My name is Ryan. Welcome back. If you're a returning listener, welcome if this is your first ever episode. I want to get right into it today because we've got a very special guest. But before we get to it, big thank you to official sponsors, FusionGamingOnline.com. They are there for all of your gaming needs. And of course, big thank you to all of the patrons over at Patreon.com slash CadPopCast. And special thank you to my good friend, Lenny Woolley Broder, new patron. Welcome to the Commander Ad Populum family. It's been a long time coming. I know he's a big supporter of mine in all forms of content that I create and... I'm super excited to link up with him at upcoming Magic Fests in 2020. And of course, everybody else I'm going to see at Magic Fest Seattle, Anaheim, Minneapolis, Vegas, including our special guest today. So let's get to it just after this. Okay, and we're back. We have a very special guest today. Gavin Verhey from Wizards of the Coast. He is the senior product architect and lead game designer, lead commander designer. What do I call you? You tell me. Yeah, I would call myself the uh, commander architect. That's kind of what I've been going for here. I'm not quite the lead game designer. I'm sure Mark Rosewater would be like, hey, I'm the lead game designer, so I don't want to take that title away from him. But um, I do a lot of game design and a lot of architecture. And um, what architecture basically means is I look at our overall product suite and figure out what we should add, uh, what we could probably do to evolve it. So, you know, for example, with Commander, how many decks should we be doing with this release? What kinds of themes should we do for this release? Are there new products like Commander Collection or Commander Legends that we want to add onto the rotation? So um, I'm thinking a lot about, about like the big, big, big picture of the Commander format. Excellent. Well, it sounds like you've been asked that question before <laughs> and you answered it right for me. So I didn't even have to answer. Have you, you've been on lots of shows where, where else have people heard you recently? I mean, I'm, I'm on shows all over the place and some of them I've recorded, I've recorded so many, I don't know when they're all going to come out, but some ones I'm on quite often is I've been on the commander and podcast numerous times. I've of course been on the command zone with Jimmy and Josh. I've done an interview with the professor. I've, um, Shivam Bot, who's on the Commander um, Advisory Group, has a, a new podcast called Casual Magic. I recorded an episode with. I've done Masters of Modern. Uh, I, I've done just up and Commander Social, up and down the chain. I do probably about at least one podcast a week, um, if not if not more. Sometimes I think I've done two this week. This is my second one. So uh, you can find me all over the internet if you just Google Gavin Verhey interview. I'm sure you will find hours and hours of fun content of me, you know, talking with the Brainstorm Brewery guys or whatever about this game that we all love so much. And and I do love magic. And now you're here on Commander Ad Populum. It truly is an honor. I know we've met very briefly on a couple occasions at Magic Fests or whatever. What what Magic Fests do you have coming up in 2020? Can you say which ones that you're confirmed to go to or no? Um, you know, I wish that I very easily could. Uh, the reality is my travel schedule is nuts, um, both personally and professionally. I love to travel, so I'm always traveling places, and work sends me a lot of places. And um, so sometimes I don't know exactly where I'm going to be more than a few months out. Um, but I can say that I will almost certainly be in Vegas this year for Magic Fest Las Vegas. is one of my favorite shows of the year. Um, I'm going to try, but in the short term, I'm going to try and make it to uh, Magic Fest Reno at the end of February. I was just at Magic Fest Austin a few weeks ago, um, and maybe a few others as well. I know there's been some talk about sending me to a few European ones. Um, I would love to go to Brazil. I've wanted to go there for a long time um, for the Magic Fest there, but nothing's quite confirmed on on those yet. Definitely stay tuned to my social media because that will I'll announce when and where I'm going to be places. But for now, I don't have anything too firm other than check me out in Vegas and then uh, Reno, hopefully. I will, however, be at the World Championships next month, which is in uh, Hawaii. I It's not a magic fest, so it's, it won't be as big, big of a draw for that reason. But if you're going to be there as a viewer or you're a local or anybody, please come by and say hi. I would love to come and hang out with you. Okay, well, you know what? All of what you said there does lead into some of our main topic conversations. You mentioned your travel. You mentioned your social media. That's at Gavin Verhe on Twitter, correct? That's absolutely correct, yes. And on Instagram, same same deal. You can find me on Facebook just by searching my name. I've got a Tumblr I'm called Gavinsight. So I'm all over the place. And the good news is with my weird last name, I kind of have a, 
SEO championship. So uh, you can search my name. You'll find out all the things that I can do everywhere. Sweet. Okay. Well, you know what? Before we get into the main topic, let's take a couple minutes for the CAD pop quick hits. Now, these are questions that were submitted by the Commander Ad Populum Discord family. A couple quick questions for guests who get to know you better. And I, I hope that they're fun and quirky. And so let's just get right into them. Great. Fantastic. Let's do it. If... If, if a movie was ever made for Magic the Gathering around one legendary creature, who would you like it to be? Oh my gosh, there are so many great options. Um, you know, you could answer Gerard, right? He's a, a classic legendary creature and talk about doing the whole Weatherlight saga. You could make some um, really goofy answer about someone like Prosh and say, hey, I want to watch a movie about this, this really cool dragon, um, for example. But for me... I would love to to see uh, some of the really, really old legends kind of get their due, like some of the untold stories of some of these legends. And I think there's a lot, especially back in the like Mirage era, that would be fun to look at. So I would love, for example, just to see a tale about Mangara. Like, what is Mangara up to these days? Um, I think that that could be, could be really fun to hear about. It's a really unique point of view, um, very interesting character. So that's one that pops into mind. But, you know, there's a lot of different avenues you could take this. I, the commander deck I play the most, of course, is Mariki Raberet, who we know almost nothing about. And I'd love to watch a, uh, a movie all about her so I could learn about what, what she's up to. I mean, Magic has so many great legendary characters, it's, it's hard to choose just one. But, yeah, I, I, I would... Uh, I would love to see some of this stuff happen. We've got our own plans right now, you know, with the Netflix show and everything. But uh, with the popularity of Commander, I'm sure that a lot of these characters will continue to work their way into um, people's gestalt of, wow, this is these char- are characters I know. And it's only a matter of time until maybe some of them show up in larger media. Yeah, and when you take a, a Commander that doesn't have a whole bunch of story kind of behind them, you can essentially do whatever you want, right? Yeah, t- to some degree. I mean, you know, you'll you'll need to kind of work through their card mechanics in if they don't have a lot of story otherwise. But it's really cool to be able to see it see them play out, and you know, you look at their color identity and think about what what they could potentially do. And I think that there's so many cards in Magic and so many legendary characters in Magic that there's so many stories to be told with all of them. And one of the great things, for example, with Commander Legends coming out later this year is the set is huge. It's got over 70 legends in it. And a lot of them are characters that you've never heard of. A lot of them are characters that are cuts from the past. For example, you've seen Baron Sengir come back. And um, I think seeing some of those play out and letting you tell your own stories or get glimpses into new worlds, interesting characters is part of what makes magic fun. Because in a way, you get to tell your own stories through a game of Commander. You get to tell your own stories when you look at a card and say, oh, I would build this kind of deck around this character. Maybe this is what they're like. Um, And I love that element of magic. I love the storytelling element of magic. And I think Commander is great for that because it really generates these whole decks that are just telling stories about a character and what they're doing. Yeah, that's right. And I think that you already answered my second quick hit question, which is what deck do you always have on you? Yeah, and it's Mariki. It's Mariki Ribera. That is my trademark commander deck. Um, I've had it for a long time. I've tweaked it here and there, but it's one of the first ones I built and I just, I love it. It's got a lot of my favorite things to do in magic. If you spell something against me at a magic fest, it's what I'll normally have on me. I will say, um, for those out there who don't know, one of my preferred ways to play commander, though, when I sit down at a table is actually borrowing someone else's deck. And I like this for a couple of reasons. One is, um, being from Wizards, I have a lot of ideas about what Commander is and what my playgroup plays. But what I really enjoy seeing when I go out and play play with someone is what's popular in their game. Like, what do their playgroup play with? What kind of decks are they building with the cards that we're making? So it's a great way for me to kind of get a greater visual a look into what's out there and what people are doing with the cards we're making in the world. Additionally, I just help find that it helps um, balance out the table, right? If we're playing a four-player game and two players are playing decks from the same collection, it probably means that at least those two are going to be balanced against each other, which just helps, you know, even out the power level of everything. Plus, also, it's very satisfying to try and win with someone else's deck. So th- there's a lot of reasons why I like to do that. So that's the, maybe the thing I do the most often. But I, I like to keep Mariki around with me. It's a deck I often travel with or put in my travel bag no matter where I'm going. Sweet. Is there a link or or a list published anywhere that I can link to? You know, I actually don't have it online. Um, I like to keep it as like a – a lot of people ask me for the deck list because they're very curious about it. I always find it's fun to be able to have it be almost like this 
pseudo legendary thing where people know that it exists and then they can come up and find me at a magic fest to play against me and see what's in it so definitely come in and seek me out if you'd like to play a game and i, I like you. that idea i like that and that leads into our next quick hit best way to approach you at a magic fest or future commander fest in general there isn't really there aren't really too many wrong ways to approach me i'm always happy to talk to fans please if you see me walking around a hall come up say hi introduce yourself Tell me what you like. I'll probably ask you some questions about what's going on in Magic. Please invite me to a game. Ask me to sign your cards. Play Matt. Always happy to do it. Um, the only things that I ask, there's only a few things that I normally ask. One, if I'm in the bathroom, that's a sacred space. Please um, do not try to initiate conversation with, with me in the bathroom. There's, I've had plenty of awkward bathroom conversations that just, you know, where they're having a long <laughs> conversation in the bathroom and then there's all these people around us and everyone's looking at us. It's, just, it's weird. Just wait till I, I get out, whatever. That's always a strange one. Second, if I'm deep in a game and I'm trying to play a game, whether it's Commander or I'm in a side draft or something, I'm happy if you come up really quick and say, hey, can you sign this for me or at least I'm going to play Matt. Happy to do that for you. But having a long conversation when I'm in a game is not really fair to anybody. It's not really fair to my opponent because I can't give them the attention that they deserve. You know, if I'm trying to play a four player commander game and they were able to sit down with me to play it, I don't want to take away from their experience. And it's also not fair to you because I'm not going to be able to give you the full attention of the conversation. So in those cases, I ask, you know, please try and come back later and find me. Um, but in general, I, I mean, I'm happy, happy to chat. If you see me, I'm more than happy to um, have a discussion and, you know, play a game of magic. I guess the last thing I'll say is, I love talking with fans. It's what I come out to a lot of these shows to do, so please come up and t talk to me. By the same token, there are a lot of people who want to chat, and um, please be conscientious of that. Sometimes people will come up and want to talk for a really, really long time, and ultimately, I only have so much time, and there's a lot of people who want to talk, and I also often have other obligations at these events. So come in, ask some questions. You know, I'll probably ask you some questions in return and kind of get a great discussion going. But when things seem to be dying off in conversation, um, please, you know, recognize that I've got other people to, to, that I need, need to get to. And it's nothing about you. Just it's about making sure I have enough time for everybody. But really, in general, there's not, not too many bad ways to approach me. I'm happy to chat about anything. And even people come up and do joking things. Like at the last Magic Fest I was at, uh, Magic Fest Austin recently, there were uh, there was a player who came up and wanted me to sign their Splinter Twin because he got banned out of his deck, or a player who wanted me to, to sign his Oko, of course, after all the stuff. And I take all that with really good really good humor and graces, and I'm happy to you know to take those hits and and lumps. Um, you know, we, we if we ban cards, we deserve to get poked fun at a little bit. Yeah, I guess common courtesy stuff, right? Where yeah, just recognizing social cues. You know, there's a lineup behind waiting to get Gavin to sign cards or what have you, right? Yeah, yeah, that happens sometimes, and it's really important that I can get to everybody because, once again, my time is really limited. Something I talk about um, a lot with my friends, I haven't really written, I've been, thinking, I've been thinking about writing an article about it, but I, ironically, as you will soon discover from the topic, is I haven't really had the time, is this kind of thing that I've been calling economy of time. And it's just that different people see time in different ways based on what their own schedule and their own busyness is like. And for me, my life is absurdly busy. I have plans basically every single night. I go to work, and if I'm not working, I'm traveling. I'm gone most weekends. Um, as we record this, it's near the end of January, and I have not been home for a weekend since September. So I am constantly on the go. I'm always busy. I have a huge social media presence that I try and manage and tweet and reply to people on. Um, I'm trying to manage all these things. It's like I'm trying to keep all these plates spinning constantly. I, there are a lot of people I know who are busier than I am, which is you know wild for me to think about, but I know they're busier than I am, and I'll send them a Facebook message, and they might not reply for weeks because they're so busy, they might not even reply at all. And there's also a lot of people who are less busy than I am, and when they'll send me messages and be like, "Yo, why don't you? Why haven't you replied to me? Or why don't you have time to talk to me for this thing or whatever? Or it'll be at an event, I want to talk for 20 minutes." And um, I think everyone kind of pegs the time availability someone has to what they're used to, and I have a very limited amount of time. I know a lot of people. Um, that I know have even less time than I do, and there are many people I know that have less, that have more time than I do. So what I ask of, of everyone, I think this is a great thing to think about in all areas of your life, is when someone is trying to get more time or you know trying to be very conscious with their time, usually it's not them being malicious toward you. It's not them saying they don't want to spend time with you or talk with you. They might just might be really busy in their life or in that moment. So um, you know, please be conscious and don't take it as any kind of slight on your character. Just be be willing to understand that, yeah, they're, they're busy right now and maybe later they'll have more time in the future. Yeah, you know what? The economy of time is something that you 
you hear that kind of phrase is the kind of thing that you hear about when you read things that, you know, the CEO of Google writes about or Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. It, 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 they've got everything that they ever want except for more time. And they find, like you said, you're managing a social media presence. That is something that you probably schedule into your day. There's some of these people that that run these Fortune 500, these billion dollar companies, what have you, or even people that are just the lead of a team like, like you are. They schedule time into their day just to sit and brainstorm about new ideas or just to think. And I think that's important if we're looking to develop in whatever we find ourselves doing, you know, cre creativity, our career career, our family, whatever it is, we got to schedule time to expand on whatever part of our life we want to grow. That actually is a great answer to lead into our actual topic. Maybe we'll we'll get back to the CAD pop quick hits at the end of the show to, to fill up the last little bit of the next episode. But I kind of want to ask you about a couple things that I told you our main topic was going to be about, and you you hinted at a couple of them already. You like to travel, and I think you were you were just recently overseas, like in Portugal or something. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, in the past two months, I have been in Portugal. I've been in Africa and Tanzania. I've been in Morocco. I've been in London. I've been all over the place uh, in the U.S. I've been to L.A. and New York and uh, Texas all kinds of places. And if you extend that window a few months back, I've been to Italy and um, Germany and all, all over the place. I mean, like I said, I haven't had a weekend home since September, so I'm always on the go somewhere new and traveling around. In fact, later today, I'm going to get on a plane and go down to Los Angeles. And next week, I'm going to get on a plane and go to Utah. So I am, uh, there's no, there's no uh, end in the near term for this. I feel that I flew, I think in 2017, I was on 254 different planes. Wow. So I feel you. Wow, I that feel you. I, I should do a count at some time. <laughs> I've been thinking about doing like, I, I don't know if there's an app for this online. I bet there is somewhere where you can enter in all your travel and it makes you like a visual map of all the places you've been. That sounds like really fun to me of just like seeing the globe with all the little swirlies around it um, or seeing how, how little of the globe you could see in my case, perhaps. Oh, yeah. Or how many times you could have flown to the moon and back. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of my life goals is to go to every country in the world. So um, I am slowly working toward that. I'm getting, I'm about at 80 now. I think I'm just a little bit short. I'll have to go back and do a count. Um, but I've been a lot of places and there's still so much more for me to go see. Wow. Have you played magic in every country you've been to? That's my own question. I wish somebody would ask that for me, but that was my own that I asked just now. Almost every country, there's any country that has a magic presence, I will always go seek out a game shop there. And I love it because one of the great things about magic is it's this universal language, this universal understanding. I've waltzed into a game shop in the middle of nowhere and had people want to sit down and play a game. In fact, you mentioned Portugal. A few weeks ago for New Year's, I was on the island of Madeira in Portugal. Uh, Madeira is well known for having the largest fireworks display in the world um, and is one mini Guinness record. Guinness Awards for it. And I wanted to go and check it out because I'm always into new experiences. But the whole island of Madeira, it's, it's way off the coast of Portugal. It's about 25 miles long. So it's not a very long um, island at all. And I'm just waltzing around the city, just looking around, looking around. It's a cute little place. And I turn the corner at one, one point, and there's a tiny little game shop. And I'm like, oh, cool, a game shop. I'll go on in because I'm always curious if they're going to sell magic. And I walk inside, and lo and behold, of course, they have a little bit of magic on the shelves. The shelves are, you know, a little scattered with various games and, you know, dusty old stuff. There's some magic there, and there's even have some Throne of Eldraine. And um, I just go walk toward the back of the store, and a player who's just sitting there in the corner looks up, and he recognizes me instantly. And he comes up. He says, hi. He's a big fan. He's shocked that I'm there. He's like, what are you doing here in Portugal? I tell him the story. And then we spend the next hour just playing Magic. You know, he buys some packs, and we do a little Winston draft, a one-on-one -on -one draft format. And it's amazing. We have this instant connection. And I don't know many other things in the world where you can walk into a store and have an instant connection across languages because he didn't, he didn't speak – I mean, he speaks some English. I didn't, didn't speak any Portuguese. But we were able to have a conversation through Magic. We were able to laugh and smile and play a game and instantly become friends – based on the same thing that we love. And that happens to me all the time. And so whenever I'm somewhere, I try and go and see if there's a magic store there. Some countries like um, Tanzania or Kenya, not a lot of magic happening there. But otherwise, um, you know, most places in Europe, anywhere in the States, Australia, Japan, most of Asia, I always try and go seek out magic players and magic stores. I think it's a lot of fun. 
Yeah, that's actually pretty incredible that Magic has become a game that is, it kind of transcends culture and language and everything, sort of like soccer or football, hockey in in a lot of the world, rugby in lots of the world, uh, cricket in lots of the world, right? For Magic to be compared to, chess is another one, for Magic to be compared to those games that have been around for decades and hundreds of years... It's pretty incredible for what it's accomplished in in its 20-something year lifespan. Yeah, that immediate kinship is just so powerful, and I see that all the time. I mean, Magic, whenever someone asks, how do I make friends in a new city that I'm going to? I'm like, Magic is amazing. You can go to a game store. You will instantly have a community. You will meet new people. You'll want to hang out with them. And I think about some of my most long-term friends And many of them I met through magic. And now we do a lot more than just magic. You know, we hang out, we go to the movies, we we talk about our lives and serious topics and help each other out. Um, But we all met through this game. You know, I think um, it's it's actually funny. This past weekend, I got together a group of 10 friends that we all used to play in PTQs back in the day. Before I went to come work at Wizards, I was a professional magic player and I qualified through the PTQ circuit. And the 10 of us probably hadn't been in the same room in over 10 years. And I ran this little event. I called it the Gavin, the Gav Invitational. I thought that was kind of a clever name. And um, we, I made up all these wacky formats and brought a bunch of you know old sets we got to play with and whatever. And we just spent a weekend in a cabin, all playing games, reminiscing about our old times, and catching up on our lives. And it was amazing to think how these people who hadn't seen each other in such a long time had this instant kinship and instant bond back together. And um, magic is incredible for that. You know, it doesn't matter how long you've been away from someone. You can always talk and reminisce about the past, and you can easily catch up with someone because you understand their mindset from playing this game with them for so long. So I have found it's been incredible and fundamental in my life, and I literally cannot imagine a life without magic at this point. Yeah, that's that's real life. Coming from somebody else who does magic as part of their their everyday life, everyday living to make a living, I 100% agree with you. Sounds like the ideal location. Going up to the lake, secluded, just magic, good food, some drinks maybe, right? And just jamming games maybe a whole week and maybe going down to some kind of all-inclusive resort with all of your magic friends and all of their significant others and just jamming, right? I encourage everyone to give something like that a try. You know, I feel... As though, first of all, we all have this great bond through magic and we can play a lot of magic, but also find time, you know, to spend time with some of these folks outside of just the magic sphere because a lot of them are so interesting. I mean, behind every magic player is an entire life that is not magic. And if you're playing magic, you know, you're probably pretty smart and pretty interesting. And there's a lot of really cool and interesting things that these folks do. So definitely I would give someone like that a try. Grab some of your closest friends, plan a weekend, and just see what happens. And if you need any assistance, reach out to me. I'd be happy to provide some suggestions for fun formats you could do or, um, you know, ways to run the event. But I, I had a great time doing it. I've done this with many friends now, and it's always a fantastic experience. Yeah, well, here, you know what, before we get too far away from your traveling experience, I have a couple couple more questions about that because that I think to many people is is interesting and because it is sort of a universal language, I think it it makes for great conversation regardless of where people are listening in the world. I want to know from your experience playing magic across the world essentially and anybody that is on any of the Wizards of the Coast team who are responsible for magic are other countries or other cultural influences part of your design process like some some cultures in different countries aren't as conversational as as those that are in north america or maybe some people you know like to play magic socially at the bar and have drinks instead of at a local game store for example do those kinds of real life scenarios find their ways into the cards that you guys make well i first of all i think to you make a great point and we are a global game right we're played all around the world as i mentioned and one of the things about that is we have to cater to different audiences in different places and While the majority of us are headquartered out here in Renton, Washington, we actually have teams all around the world that are in their local countries that both provide us feedback and help manage everything over there to adapt magic to their local area. You know, for example, in Japan, Japan has a lot of very small game stores. They've got a few bigger ones now. It's less than it used to be. Haruyuya, for example, is a very big store. But in general, they have a ton of very small game stores. Um, Additionally, Japan is very unique in that 
card games are extraordinarily well known about. Like the market penetration on card games is 90 plus percent. Everyone knows that card games exist. It's not like in the US where a lot of people have never even heard of what a card game might be. And so the market there is quite different. And so some things that they do to cater to this is really they might come up with smaller experiences. Um, Commander is a little different there because you don't have the big game stores that can hold hold these big social events. So there's a lot of stuff like, like that to think about. As opposed to, say, something like London, which I think I thought you brought up a great example with the pubs, where the culture there is much more, let's go, I'll go out to a pub and play some, some games as opposed to going to a game store. And how can we support that and give them the, the materials they need and understand that some people will want to run events in locations um, that are pubs or the locations that serve alcohol. So we have to adapt the entire game and our entire organized play structure and, and what's going to work for the local audience. That's really important. We do take a lot of different cultures into account, and we like to be able to show off a lot of stuff in our game. For example, Kaladesh had a bit of Indian inspiration. Um, so you, you've seen a lot of things uh, trickled in here and there uh, to, our, to our game. So we are always looking at the world for different kind of things and inspiration that we could build into it, and not just in the actual cards themselves, but in how the game is played as well. Yeah, you mentioned organized play, and that's why maybe, I think it was last year, the year before, we saw that subtle change where organized play can now happen in bars or pubs and, and catering to the cultural aspect behind, I'll call it more casual organized play is maybe why we saw that change is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, definitely the UK was a big influence with that. Um, it's We have to make sure that magic can be played in the way that the local area wants to play magic. You know, ultimately... Our job as Wizards of the Coast is to <clears throat> make magic players happy. And how can we do that the best we can? And, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone has, as I say that, there's probably some people s smiling or snickering because everyone always has things they wish were different with magic and, or things that they're, you know, frustrated about with magic. And, but I do feel like we are trying our best to make people happy. Um, just sometimes we are not making every audience happy at the same time. And, and we do try to manage that all, but it, it's tricky. There's a lot of Magic players, and one of Magic's greatest strengths is that it's so many different games and so many different people, but that also means that it's so many things that we have to work on to try and make happy at the same time. And we're, we always try our best, but sometimes it can take a little bit of time. So if, you, if you're happy right now, great. And if there's something that you're unhappy about, know that we're probably aware of it and working on it. Yeah, that's like a relationship with anything though, right? Like it's it's easy to point out the the negative things, the things that you wish were, you know, I I, I wish my wife did this or she wishes I did that, but it it's a little bit harder to recognize and acknowledge the the positive points and I think that organized play to cater to different cultural norms around the world was was an excellent answer. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a big it's something big that we always think about and that our organized play team is thinking about constantly. All right. So that ends the first half of our interview with Gavin. Big thank you to him, of course, for taking time out of his busy schedule to spend some time with us. Of course, big thank you to FusionGamingOnline.com. They are the official sponsors of CAD Pop. Check them out. And they are Canadian based. If you are in Canada, cheap, affordable shipping. If you're outside of Canada, of course, you can still order from them. And of course, you can send that stuff to me if you are into altered art cards. They are the fastest way to get me cards to get them altered and then turned around out the door back to you. Big thank you to all of the Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash cadpopcast. One of the benefits, of course, is the Discord channel. We've got lots of great discussion on there, lots of support for each other in our regular everyday lives, like the stuff that we were talking about with Gavin this week and next week. We talk about his travels, his work, his how he deals with pressure. So all of that stuff is the kind of stuff that we talk about all the time on the Discord. So if that sounds like a good community that you'd want to be a part of, Feel free to sign up, become a patron, and if you do, I would greatly appreciate it. And that's it, everybody. We'll be back next Wednesday for the conclusion of our interview with Gavin. More great conversation, some stories. I can't wait. I'm going to go and listen to the whole interview now. I will see you next Wednesday.